All right, well, I'm just so glad that you're here. My name is Jess. Um, my husband Sam and I are the lead pastors of C3, and so on behalf of us, welcome. Uh, Sam is in Hamilton at our Hamilton location, preaching down there today. Uh, we also have our Midtown location, where Calvin was speaking at today. So just love that we get to have three locations now, more ways for people to meet Jesus and be in community like this. So it's really fantastic. Um, and there's got some, lots of great things happening. Her night next week, super excited for that. I know we already announced it, but I just you know wanted to put it out there again because it's one of my favorite uh, nights of the year. We have about three of them a year, and uh, they're always really special, key nights, and uh, amazing things happen at the nights. Like it's an amazing presence, but also we have like crazy miracle stories that have been coming out of the nights. So I really would love for you to be there and not miss out on that. So come along, bring your friends. Would love to have you there. And we're also in uh, this Lent season, which is amazing. If you don't know what Lent is all about, Pastor Greg did a great job of explaining it a little bit uh, just before in the announcements, but uh, we'd love to invite you to join us to be a part of that. There's a weekly podcast, we're doing prayer uh, at all three of our locations twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays and lots of other great stuff. So you can go on our website or you can chat to anybody that like has a lanyard or the blue spot in the back and we'd love to give you any information you need on Lent because it's great. You might as well join in now. I mean, we've already been doing it for a week, but join in. Why not? There's still time, and Lent is the season up until Easter, so you've got time to be a part of this. So we are in our series called Saints. Saints. And I don't know uh, what you think of when you hear the word saints. I know for me, for the longest time, I was like, I got this picture of um, like maybe going to an art gallery and seeing like those really old paintings with someone very pious with like the halo above their head or like a statue, like, you know, some old beautiful statue in a beautiful place, like, you know, being a depiction of what a saint would be. And I never thought of myself as a saint even growing up, like, this, the word saint wasn't used as a good word. It was, like, used as a word to make fun of somebody. It was like, oh, what, you won't do that? Oh, you're just such a saint? Like, it wasn't even, like, a complimentary word. And so the idea that we are actually called to be saints was such a foreign idea for me because of the pictures that I had of what a saint was and then the contrast to what I know that I am, going, that doesn't line up. I don't have everything all sorted. I'm not perfect, far from it. I, I don't feel like I'm a holy one, which is what the word saint actually means. It means holy one or set apart. And I'm like, I don't feel holy. <laughs> I don't feel set apart. I feel very average and very ordinary. And so... That's why we're talking about this series, because the actual, actual fact of it is, is that we are all saints. And where it comes from is this uh, book of the Bible called Corinthians. And so Paul has written a bunch of different books in this Bible, and a lot of them are actually to churches. And so the Corinthians was actually a church. It was a church in Corinth. So he's saying, hey, C3 is, this is a letter to you. Hey, Corinthians, this is a letter to you. And he talks about that we are called to be saints called to be holy ones, set apart. And then the rest of the book, though, doesn't talk about how perfect they are. <laughs> He's not saying, well done, good job, you guys are saints because you've nailed this and this and you're doing this perfectly and you're doing that really, really well as well. And, and did I mention everything else you're doing really well? Good job. That's not at all what the letter is about. In fact, most of these letters that he's written to the churches, it's like, good job on this, but you definitely need to deal with this. This is in your church and you need to sort it out. And if you don't deal with this, then there's, like, you're not going to be as close to Jesus as you want to be. Or, like, and so there's a lot of corrections in there. And so Corinthians, he's saying that you're saints, but then he spends a lot of the book correcting them. And so we have this mesh where we're like trying to reconcile it then in our minds where we're like, okay, so we're holy and we're set apart, but yet we're imperfect. And what it is, it's actually we're holy and set apart if we believe in Christ and we believe and follow after him. It's not actually perfection, but it's the act of following Christ that sets us apart. So I want to dive a little bit deeper into it today. I'm actually going to be preaching from Galatians 5, 
if you want to turn there. Galatians 5, and I'm going to start in verse 13. And the little subtitle in my Bible is Life by the Spirit. And that's my title for the message today because to be saints, I'm going to give you the the end of the message right now, okay? So if you want to leave, then you have the point and you can go on about your day. But the only way that we can be saints and actually live our life as saints is by the Spirit. It's the only way. We can't do it by ourselves. It requires the Holy Spirit, walking with the Spirit. And so, verse 13, let's get into it. It says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Freedom is the key component of Christianity, which honestly is foreign to a lot of us because it's when you say to anybody that doesn't have an exposure to Christianity, hey, did you know that the core component of Christianity is freedom? Most people are not going to believe you. The whole idea of Christianity outside of this, outside of this church, is often rules and bondage and you must do this and you must do that. But actually at the core of Christianity is freedom. It's freedom in life and freedom in Christ. And it's such a a different way of looking at it. So I love that he's setting up this verse with freedom, but to not use that freedom in the wrong way. Verse 14, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Then verse 16, which is where I'm going to be focusing more, is so I say, walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify those desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. I don't know if that's what you're expecting to hear today, but you cannot do whatever you want. I cannot do whatever I want. The Bible has some other instructions for us. Verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. 19, this is where it starts getting like listy. So it's like the first part he's saying, okay, just as a reminder, before I get into all these lists of things, because I don't want you to think that Christianity is a bunch of lists of do's and don'ts, what I want you to remember is it's freedom, 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 freedom. And God actually wants us to be free from bondages, free from oppression, free from pain. However, there are some lists that I want to share with you. (laughs) And so in verse 19, he starts to go into these lists. He says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like, just in case I missed a few. It's not an extensive list, it's, but it's, I mean, it's pretty extensive, but there's definitely more there as well. And then it says, but I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And it's not because, it's not, the reason that people don't inherit the kingdom of God when they live that way is because to be in relationship with Christ, we do need to be holy ones and set apart. I'm, I'm kind of pointing out the wrestle here. And in order to be in his presence, there needs to be perfection, but that actually comes through a relationship with Jesus. I'll get there. I'll get there. So, verse 22, and then this is the really good news. So it's like freedom is the basis of your Christianity. Please walk by the Spirit. There are these other things that you're going to get stuck in, but here's the good news. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience or forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified this flesh with its passions and desires. So since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit and let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. You know, growing up, I grew up in a Christian home and this verse, this fruit of the Spirit verse was actually one of the memory verses that uh, my mom had done. There was a time when she got all inspired to, um, I don't know if anybody else grew up in a 90s Christian home, but I'm going to give you a little snapshot into what it was like. She got inspired once, 
went to like the big chunky family computer and typed in some scriptures and printed them out. She designed them with like clip art. I'm pretty sure like the Fruit of the Spirit one had like a picture of grapes like on the side. And I don't think they were color either. We, we weren't, didn't have color back then. It was just black and white. And she printed them off and she laminated them and put them in places around the house so that we would find ourselves reading them at times. And I guess she put them in the most common places that we were spending our time, and that was the bathroom. (laughs) And so I remember this verse being like on the door that I could see from the shower. And I guess I spent a lot of time in the shower because for me, this verse is one that I read over and over and over and over again as a kid. And it's one that I could still recite in a second now. It's ingrained in me. And oh my goodness, learning and memorizing scripture is so good for you. It's so good for us. I know it could seem like a thing that we get our kids to do, but we don't do it. No, it's so good for us. But as a seven-year-old, I didn't necessarily know the context of what that was. I actually don't think I knew what I was reading. What is what is a fruit of the Spirit? Like, and spe- like our kids at the moment are actually learning this very memory verse in C3 Kids, which is crazy. Little, there's a little magnet that we sent home for all the parents, and it has like a little picture of a salad bowl, and each, <laughs> each piece of fruit has a different fruit of the Spirit on it. And it's, I love it. I'm glad. I'm so glad that they're learning that. But to have the context of what this scripture actually is, is so key. Because if we don't know the context, then we won't use it correctly. We won't know how to use it right. And we can do that so often. So many times we can pick verses out of the Bible just like, oh, that one sounds good. And we can start quoting it over our life or even telling it to other people. And yet it's completely out of context. Like even, do you know Jeremiah 29, 11, it's like, for I know the plans I have for you. He says, look, great, you can own it as yours, but he's actually speaking to Jeremiah. So, like, we can kind of own it as ourselves, but, like, read it in context because the whole story of Jeremiah is actually really crazy and really exciting and a great story to read rather than just pulling the scripture and going, God has good things for me. It's much better that we know the context. And so this scripture with the fruits of the Spirit, I wanted to dive into that context. Like I said, he starts with freedom to really set the, pre- like the preface for the whole scripture. And then he talks about uh, the, the fight between the spirit man and our um, nature as well. And then the lists and everything. So let's get into kind of more of the depth of the context. So in verse 16, it says, So I walk by the spirit and... You will not gratify, right? So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. 17. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. So my first point is our flesh and Spirit are in conflict, they're in conflict. The flesh in this part, um, it means it does mean our body, like our physical body, but it also it actually means like that natural, I guess, sinful side of man, and like what we naturally want to go to rather than what God wants us to go to. And the truth is, is that every single one of us have it. None of us get to a point where we no longer have that. And this honestly opened my eyes as I was studying this scripture because in culture and what I've heard so much is there's so much talk around, I guess, wholeness and you know what? You need to like really reconcile everything that's going on inside of you and you need to like, you need to be one with your body and you need to be one with your mind and everything. You need to be very present. You need to be very one. You need to have a good understanding of where you want to go and step out of that in the fullness of who you are. There's some element of truth to that. But can I encourage you that you're actually never going to get there? Because what Paul is saying in here is there's actually, if we are following Christ, we will always have a conflict inside of us. A forever conflict, a forever contrary part of us. 
And so if we disqualify ourselves and we go, you know what, I'm not going to step out on the things of God until I can solve this thing inside of me. I don't want to have this conflict, so I'm just going to solve it first. You're never going to get there. We never will because this conflict will be there forever. And even Paul talks about him having the very same conflict. There's a scripture in Romans where he talks about, he's like, why do I do what I don't want to do? And then I don't do what I want to do. And what is this wretched man inside of me that like, and he talks about this war going on inside of him. The war will not go away until we are in eternity. It's going to stay there. But that's an encouraging thing (laughs) because we don't have to fix that in ourselves. So when we step into something that is not who we're called to be for a second, if we get into one of those places, then we can know, you know what? I don't have to stay here. This wrestle is normal. I'm going to step back out and I'm going to step into the things that God has for me. And then we might look again and go, oh, and our natural desire might take us towards that one thing and then we can make the decision. No, I'm going in this direction. If we, unfortunately though, I see so many people disqualify themselves because of that. They'll say things like, I can't run that connect group. You don't know what I was thinking about last night. I can't run on that team. You don't know how depressed I was on the weekend. If I can just sort that out first, then you know what? I'll step into the things of God. But God actually wants us to step into it in the wrestle. (laughs) He knows what you're struggling with. He knows what you think. You can't, we can't hide that from him. He knows every single part of it, but he's like, you know what? I have better for you. I have better for you, and I want you to experience the full life. It's okay. I know you're going to go back there, but just keep coming back to me in repentance, and I'm here. I'm full of grace. I'm full, no condemnation, no shame. Just come back to me. We're all prone to this flesh sin side. And let me tell you that making the decision to follow the God side is never easy, but it's always the right decision. We can't think that we can follow that side and still be in a clear relationship with Christ. There's a difference between following that side and stepping into that side every now and then. So don't hear me wrong. Don't, don't hear me that like, okay, great, do that connect group, but also continue sinning Sunday after Sunday, Saturday after Saturday, Friday after Friday. No, 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 no. Like, that's what he said in the beginning here. This is not a freedom to then use this grace to sin. <laughs> okay, don't hear me wrong. This is a freedom to be able to have what it takes to say, okay, no, I may have fallen into that, but I am not going to continue walking that path because it's not going to give me what I need. I love then, so you go back to the, the scripture, and he talks about in the next part in 19, so it's freedom, I love that he sets it up with freedom, I know I keep saying it, but I just love that he sets it up with freedom, and then he encourages us, <laughs> doesn't sound like an encouragement, but he encourages us with the conflict that's going to be inside of us, it's okay, get used to it, it's going to be there, it's okay, every single one of us have it, let's recognize it and step into the things of God. And then in verse 19 though, he says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. That's my second point, the acts of the flesh are obvious, but sometimes they're not. So this list that he goes through, so sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft keeps going on. Some of those Sure, they may seem incredibly obvious, but I would say that a lot of us have a, actually every single one of us has a predisposition to one of those things, if not multiple of those things, but they're not always obvious. He is saying that they're obvious right here, but I've been in so many situations where I have been dealing with one of those things, and it's not obvious to myself. I think that I'm right to be dealing with those things. And so when it actually becomes obvious is when we're walking in step with the Holy Spirit. Then, oh my goodness, when we're in that new spirit man, that stuff, 
heck, it is so obvious. It is glaringly obvious that it's not who we're created to be. But when we're over in here, it's actually not as obvious. It kind of just becomes normal and natural, but it's not serving us well. So for me, social media is a big it can be a very big problem in my world. I love it and I hate it and all of the things. And it's beautifully inspiring and incredibly depressing all at the same time. And I know for my husband, different algorithm, very different algorithm to mine. For him, his jealousy probably comes up when, you know, I actually send him a lot of golf memes now. And so my algorithm is actually starting to look a lot like his algorithm. <laughs> so I sent him like golf memes and stuff and I saw one come up the other day. Did you know that there is like an Airbnb you can go to, or the golf guys are like leaning in right now, mm -hmm, tell, tell me more, that has its own golf course that you can just like play on when like while you're staying there you just you can play all day jesse you can play all day you can play all night if it's well lit you know yeah talk about heaven right not for me for my husband though but i can imagine he's he would look at something like that and be like oh i would love to do that and you know he's more holy than me so i'm sure that it stays at that for me though my algorithm just loves to poke at my insecurities and I remember this one moment, it was 10 years ago now, because my son is 10, and I had just had my son. He was about a week old. And there was this beautiful, inspiring, amazing Christian woman that I followed. I thought she was great. I was like, you're so cool. I would love to be like you. You're awesome. And yet it took a turn where, yeah, my son was a week old, and I was following, scrolling, whatever, you know, as you do. And there was a picture that she had posted, and she just had a baby boy. She was about a month ahead of me. And the picture, amazing woman, is she's standing there, like, looking just so beautiful. Everything is perfect. Like, when I tell you it's perfect, think even more perfect than the picture you have in your head, okay? Like, her hair was perfect. My hair was probably in some messy mum bun or I don't even know, all knotty. She literally looked like she had not had a baby. She looked fitter than before she fell pregnant. I was like, I don't even know how that's possible, but great, good for you. And as I kept studying this picture, it was, it was like just stopped on this picture. And she's standing there and she's got her baby in the stroller. I think the comment was something like, you know, going out for a walk, sunny day or whatever. And the stroller, I tell you, it wasn't just the top of the line stroller. It was like the limited edition version of the top of the line stroller, which you only get if you know someone. Like this is like, and if you are a parent in this place, you know that strollers aren't cheap to start with. Like we're talking like 2,000 bucks like for a new stroller, guys. If you don't have, if you don't have parents in your world, please Pray for the parents in your well, because baby stuff ain't cheap, okay? So this doll is probably like three, maybe four thousand dollars that she's just holding on to, just pushing her baby around town. You know, and I mean I didn't even I didn't zoom in, but I'm sure if I zoomed in, there's probably thousands of dollars on her hands as well. Like I don't know. But I'll tell you what, my jealousy kicked in real bad in that moment. I was comparing my situation to hers. I was comparing the fact that I had a second hand stroller you know what, it did the job, it was great. <laughs> but the second I saw that one, I was like, I want that one. <laughs> I don't want the one I have. I want her body. I don't want what I've got. I want to look like that. I don't want to look like the way I do. And I found myself in this disgusting place of jealousy. It started as insecurity, turned into jealousy. I found myself screenshotting it. I'm really late letting you into my world right now, okay? But I'm saying it because I know you've all done it as well. I screenshotted it and I sent it to one of my friends. And I would love to say that my friend called me out on it, but she didn't. The text message probably had some foul words in it that I sent, like, can you believe it? Like, it's hurt. Like, who cares if she does that, really? Like, she can post whatever she wants to post. But, man, it affected me. And my friend sent back, like, oh, I know. Tell me about it. And then adds on. Gosh, I wish she had called me out in that moment because that thing festered. 
I could tell you right now, I could probably, I'm a terrible painter, but if I could paint or draw or something, I could draw you the exact image again. It is so ingrained in my head from how much it affected me. And it was about two weeks later, and God convicted me because my insecurity had turned to jealousy, which is one of these lists, if you didn't realize in here. It's not just, oh, you were jealous, yeah, no big deal. No, no, it's like something that stops me from being in the kingdom of heaven. (laughs) It had turned to jealousy, but then it had gone another step and it actually turned to hatred. I found myself starting to hate this woman. She did nothing wrong. She did nothing to me. She had absolutely no reason to be hated in that moment. But God convicted me and showed me (laughs) what I was feeling and how I was acting, and I was like okay. But he didn't leave it at that. He asked me to do two different things. (laughs) One of them he asked me to do was to pray for her. (laughs) I was like, are you for real? (laughs) Like, she's clearly already in the blessing of heaven. (laughs) Why does she need me to pray for her blessing as well? Like what, you want her to have even more stuff? Even more beauty? (laughs) It's real. But I did. I was like, okay, all right, God, I pray. Pray for a marriage. You know, maybe a marriage sucks. (laughs) No, Lord, no, I do. I pray for blessing in her life. I pray that she has a great relationship with her kid. I pray that things go well for her. I pray that she's close to you. And I felt my heart start to shift. And then the second thing that he asked me to do was to be grateful for what I did have. And man, was I challenged as my heart started to shift towards her and I realized how amazing my life was and how I had been so blind to it in that moment. I was holding our son, who we had tried for for years. Like, we hadn't been out of full pregnant and we were believing and praying and, and he was our miracle baby And yet, all my attention and focus was spent hating somebody else and their baby. Like, it sounds ridiculous to say back to myself now. I'm like, what is wrong with me? But that's the wrestle that we're all in to some extent with one of these sins. I've just shared mine, jealousy and hatred. But every single one of us has a predisposition to at least one, maybe a few. Maybe all of them. Who knows? I don't know. That's between you and God. But we all have it, and that's the wrestle. But God's grace was so good to not leave me there that when I did those two things, I felt an insane shift. (laughs) That fruit of the Spirit came into my life like you have no idea. I felt more love than I had felt in this whole season. I felt more joy. I was looking at my son with a smile on my face. I was looking at my whole entire world with so much more peace and goodness and just filled with life. All because God highlighted that for me. And he'll be highlighting things in this service today to you. And it's not to condemn you. And it's not for you to feel shame. And it's not for you to disqualify yourself. But it's actually so that we can give it up to him, make the adjustments, and then be able to feel the fruit of his spirit come into our life. He wants every single one of us to be walking in that whole list of fruits, the whole amount of joy and love and peace that we could ever walk in. And so that is my third point today, because as we've gone through that scripture, There's the freedom, there's the encouragement that we're going to have that conflict inside of ourselves. And then there's the list of like, hey, you know what? I'm going to give you a list because this might trigger some thoughts for you on some ways that you might be, you know, not in the sweet spot with God. But again, not extensive. Let him highlight what it is for you. But let's leave you with the good news of that. We're not going to leave people with just being the awareness of how they're falling short, 
But what we're actually going to do is fill people with the Holy Spirit so that we can walk in step and have the fulfillment from Him. And so the third point is keep in step with the Spirit. Keep in step with the Spirit. Like I said at the beginning, it is the only way that we will ever achieve sainthood, I guess. <laughs> it's a bad way of saying it. It's the only way that we can be holy ones and set apart is to do it by His Spirit. It, we cannot achieve it in our own strength. We can't because we keep going back here. But He knows that. And so that's why His Spirit is here on earth. And, you know, we say often as a church that we are Spirit-filled, but we are down to earth. And that's because, honestly, a lot of the time when someone says the Holy Spirit, we get some weird thing like thinking up in our head. I grew up in a very Pentecostal upbringing and saw some really weird things, really weird things. But when I read the Bible and I see the fruit of the Spirit, none of that list is weird to me. You know, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it doesn't say, hey, the fruit of the Spirit is levitating. You're going to like levitate now. Isn't that so cool? It doesn't say, oh, your, your hands are going to tingle and you're going to pray for someone. and It's going to be like whew, fireworks and some, sure, something like, like that might happen. But I tell you what, the Holy Spirit is so grounded and so normal and knows exactly what we need that the fruit of what he's saying right here is actually what we want and need. Love isn't weird. Peace isn't weird. <laughs> Joy isn't weird, although maybe sometimes it can be a little bit weird. Goodness, kindness, the fruits of the Spirit are not weird. And so why would we not want to walk in step with the Holy Spirit, the person who knows us so well, that wants to give us these fruits along every step of the journey? If you invite the Holy Spirit into your world, you have nothing to be afraid of. It is not a scary thing, but it is the most fulfilling thing because he knows what you need. And I love that it is the fruit of the Spirit and it's the acts of the flesh, or depending on the version, the works of the flesh. And so I love the contrast between the two because so often what we do is we act and we work in this realm when what we actually need is the fruit from this realm. So we do and we try and we work hard, but what God actually wants us to do is to just abide in his Holy Spirit, just to take each step with him, to ask him. There's a big difference between acts and fruit. And the other interesting thing between the two of them is actually how... Um, how we can actually do those acts in order to try and get the fruit. So we're not just doing these acts because, oh, yeah, okay, we're sinful people, yeah, great. But it's actually crazy how much we do these things to try and get the fruit. But if we were just abiding in the fruit, we'd have the fruit, right? So we can act out in sexual immorality because we're trying to find the fruit of love. But if we abide in his Holy Spirit, love is the fruit. We can act out in impurity or debauchery because we're trying to find the fruit of joy. We're just trying to have some fun, you know, like let's have a laugh, let's have fun. But it doesn't actually give us the joy that we're looking for. The, the joy comes from abiding in his Spirit. We can act out in idolatry and witchcraft to find peace. The word witchcraft actually in this, in the Bible, it actually comes from the root word of pharm pharmakeia. I could be saying that completely wrong. Um, but it actually comes from the fact that uh, Paul was trying to say in the ancient world, people used drugs to hallucinate or to escape reality. And so we're not talking witchcraft as in, you know, the occult over there, although that is also something that happens. But he's directly speaking to things that we use in our life to try and escape our reality, to try and find peace. But peace can't be found there. We can't work our way and act our way to peace. It only comes from the fruit of the Spirit. 
And I was acting in jealousy and hatred towards that girl because I needed the fruit of love. I didn't, wasn't feeling God's love or his peace or his joy in that moment. My husband was away. My son was seven days old. My husband actually had to fly to Australia when Noah was six days old to bury his mum because she passed away two days before Noah was born. And so here I was, I'm not feeling joy. I mean, I was feeling joy with my son, but man, that grief joy mix was a real mix. I didn't know what things were happening, but I reckon that that jealousy and that hatred would have been a way to kind of gain some joy in my life. Send it to a friend, make her laugh as well. (laughs) Haha, now we're both laughing at this girl. Oh, there's some joy. It didn't actually give me that. It actually really left me feeling the opposite. So no amount of acts will get us the fruit. Only obedience and walking in step with Christ. And so how do we do that then? So I've talked all about it and you're like, cool, awesome. (laughs) I'm going to walk away from here and I know that I should be walking with the Spirit. But how do I actually do that? That sounds kind of like an elusive thought. Like, what does that actually look like? Well, let me tell you, it's incredibly simple, but it is not easy. Incredibly simple, but not easy. Number one, pray regularly. So simple. How many times have we said that from stage? Just get a regular prayer life. It'll help your world. And then we go into our week, we're like, yeah, we're going to do it. And then 6 a.m. hits and we're like, oh. I don't actually feel that great. I reckon I'll feel better if I snooze my alarm and get the extra sleep. I'm saying it because I've done it, okay? I'm saying it because I've done it. And then I wake up 10 minutes later, I tell you what, I don't feel any better, okay? That extra 10 minutes sleep did not replace the extra prayer time. Pray regularly. Not easy, but it's simple. Inquire of the Spirit regularly. How often do we actually ask the Holy Spirit? So often in Christianity, people say things like, oh, well, if it's God's will, there's a lot of this like passiveness of like, oh, God will just do his thing and I'll just, I'm with him, but he's just doing his thing. But like he wants relationship with us. How often do we ask the Spirit heading into a meeting, Holy Spirit, can you just be with me? Can you guide me? Give me some discernment. Give me some wisdom in this meeting. Again, incredibly simple, but not easy. I actually remember working retail once and I had to go into a back shoe room because I had like some, a meeting coming up that I was really stressed out about. But like if I am in retail and I'm on the floor and I'm praying to the Holy Spirit, that's a bit weird, okay? So I went to like the back like warehousey shoe area and like just said a little quick prayer and my gosh, I felt the Holy Spirit like that. But how often do we avoid that because it's like, oh, this isn't the right time to ask him. So pray regularly and inquire of the Spirit regularly. Read the Word regularly and in its entirety. So don't just go to the one book that you like. (laughs) Don't just go to the couple of scriptures that we like. Don't take the scriptures out of context either, but don't just keep reading the same thing over and over. Read the thing front to back. Do a Bible in a year. When you start to see the context of things, my gosh, I think this is the third year that I'm doing Bible in a year, and it is bananas. The percentage of this that is like, fear God, fear God, fear God, fear God. Oh, and then he killed these people because they didn't fear God. And then he killed these people because they didn't fear God. But if you come to church and you just hear like a couple of really exciting New Testament verses, you're like, God's just like amazing. And you're like, he is, he is. But we need to have that reverence of him. So read it in its entirety. (laughs) Read it in its entirety. And then you know what? Spend time with people who also pray, also inquire, and also read the word in its entirety. It will change you. You cannot do Christianity by yourself. I cannot do Christianity by myself. We have connect groups that you can be a part of. We have teams. Our teams, with people that serve together, also talk about this stuff together and like encourage one another in the Lord. How about we don't be that girl that I texted 
and encourage people into the bad stuff in the world. <laughs> but we be the person that's like, you know what? I know you're feeling that way right now, but how about, how about we think differently about this situation? How about we inquire of the Holy Spirit in this? Have you read a scripture that helps you with that recently? Let's be those friends. And that's what we've been talking about with one-to-one discipleship. You can learn a lot from coming to church and hearing preachers, and we can learn a lot from podcasts, and we can learn a lot from church. But I tell you what, doing life with people, oh, it's been the answer for me in drawing closer to God, doing it with people. They, they know me, and I can't hide anything. Like the whole thing about this, um, the flesh being obvious, it tends to be more obvious if we let people into our world. <laughs> It's a lot easier to hide when we're just by ourselves. And so this whole chapter basically comes to the point where it's like, let's examine ourselves. So Christ cares because he wants us to live in the Spirit. He wants us to live in the fruits of the Spirit. But we can't do that unless we actually examine ourselves and where we're at and what what our predispositions are and what we may even be fully acting out in that are in that list, or maybe it's in the like category. It might not be specifically in that list. And so what I want to do is I want to actually ask everybody to stand up. I'm actually going to invite the entire band back up. So we have a little bit of time in this service, just a little bit, just a smidge. And there's this scripture in Romans 8, and it's another great um, passage to read about doing life in the Spirit, It talks all about how to do life through the Spirit as well. It's a great kind of like uh, mirrored up chapter. And it says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. So if you feel yourself sitting over here in this old man's side, not old man as in like an old person, old man as in like the part of you that you know isn't who God wants you to be. If you find yourself in that side, there is freedom for you. There is freedom that you don't have to stay there. I'm not saying that you won't step back every now and then accidentally or unintentionally or whatever, but if it is holding you, to the point that you feel like you can't even step into that side, there is freedom. And I also want to encourage that there is no condemnation, just like this verse says, that there is no condemnation, there is no shame, there is no like, oh, you are less than because you struggle with these things. Just like I said at the beginning, there is freedom in Christ. He wants to set each and every one of us free. And so what we're going to do is I just want everybody to close your eyes across this room. I'm going to have a moment between us and God in heaven. Close your eyes. You can bow your heads. You can put your hands out in front of you. And I believe that as I was speaking, or even now in this, situ- in this time, that I believe that the Holy Spirit is highlighting which area in that list that He wants us to deal with. That is a, could be a really scary thought for some people. It could be a very vulnerable thought for some people. But I want to tell you that you're not a bad person because you have that feeling. Remember I said we are all in this conflict. Even Paul has this conflict. We all have it. It might be one thing, it might be a few, but I believe the Holy Spirit is highlighting it right now highlighting how we've acted in certain ways to try and create a fruit and it's not fulfilling. And I believe as those things are highlighted that all it takes is our repentance. And repentance is a great thing because what it does is it actually gives it up to God and it allows Him to move. And so I encourage you, across the room right now. No one's paying attention to anybody else. This is just your moment with God. I encourage you to give that thing up to Him. It might have full control over you. It might have a little bit of control over you. It doesn't matter. Even the littlest bit of control is too much control. And 
I believe right now the Holy Spirit is in this room and it is ministering to every single person that as we are here with repentant hearts, the fruit of the Spirit is filling each and every one of us. Whatever that act is, whatever that work is, that wants love or is doing it for peace or is doing it for joy, as we repent, I can feel the Holy Spirit filling every single one of us with that fruit that there is joy filling up people's hearts where there has only ever been heartbreak, where there has only ever been despair, but there is joy, that there is peace filling people's hearts in this room that have never felt peace, that have carried stress and anxiety and worry and have done everything that we possibly can to try and gain peace. The Holy Spirit is meeting right now. A peace that transcends all understanding is what the Bible says. It will not make sense. These fruits of the Spirit do not make sense in our head. Don't try to make sense of them. Thank you, Lord, that you are here in this place. I thank you for every single person right now, Lord. I thank you that you love every single individual in this room, that there is absolutely nothing that we could hide from you. And so your love is that much more exceptional because you know every single detail of our world and yet you love us. And Lord, I thank you for how your Holy Spirit is ministering right now. I thank You that it will not be the end, that as You continue to highlight things through the week, that we will continue to be obedient, Lord, and continue to repent and give them up to You and continue to feel the fruit of Your Holy Spirit come into our world, Lord. It is the only thing that will satisfy our needs. It is the only thing that will bring fulfillment. Thank You, Lord, for Your presence. I thank You that it is not weird, I thank you that it is so accessible that we don't have to be like the high priest in the Old Testament, but that we can access your tangible presence at any moment. Thank you, Lord, for how you're ministering across this room right now. everybody's heads are bowed and eyes are closed I just want to invite you to make a decision to follow Jesus no one's looking around this is a moment between you and God I'm looking because I want to acknowledge your hand and be able to pray with you but I want to give you the opportunity to make a decision to follow Jesus maybe you've made the decision before and you want to come back maybe you've never made a decision It's where it all starts with. There's freedom because we believe in Him, because we believe in what He did on the cross. And I know that there's people in this room that want to experience that freedom, that have never experienced it before. And so everybody's heads are bowed, everybody's eyes are closed. And I just want to invite you to be brave and put your hand up right now if you want to make that decision to follow Jesus. Thank you. You can put your hand down. Thank you. Thank you up the back. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hand down. There's, I think, five, six hands that have gone up. It's a little bit dark, but that's fine. Don't turn the lights up. I'll tell you that there's six other people because I want you to know that you're not alone and that this is the best decision that you could ever make. So I'm going to give you one more chance (laughs) and then we're going to say a prayer together as a church. If you want to make that decision, just raise your hand up right now. Brave, big, strong, amazing. I see that hand and that hand. You guys are amazing. Thank you. You can put your hands down. There's probably about eight hands that went up around the place, which is amazing. So why don't you all just look at me right now? And what we're going to do is we're going to pray a prayer together as a church. And so if you are one of those people that put your hand up, this is your prayer between you and God. You're not praying this to me. You're not praying this to the rest of the church. And so make this 
your prayer. But the rest of the church is going to pray with you. We're all going to repeat after me because we're a community and we do this together. That's the best decision you could ever make. So repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I invite you into my heart today. I thank you. You died on the cross to set me free. I repent of my past. Make me new. Wash me clean. And help me to follow you as my Lord and my Savior from this day forward. Amen. Amen. So good. Let's celebrate. Amazing.